Hi guys, this is SDJRSNF88 speaking with a fifth update on the World War One Trench Railway project. And as you can see, over the past few weeks there's been plenty of work carried out on the layout, especially regarding the scenery. But as well as that, there's also been a lot of work on the underside of the baseboard, which we will also take a closer look at in this video. So, without further ado, let's get into the update. So one of the biggest changes since the previous update is the uh, ballast is now down. Now this was very time consuming and it was uh, quite fiddly as well at times. I've never uh, ballasted 009 track before. Uh, but um, once I got the hang of it, it went down quite well. Um, it took a couple of days. Uh, I did it in sections uh, so I didn't rush myself. Uh, so basically I started off uh, working uh, from the left of the layout to the right. So I basically started off at the left here uh, from the wood and worked my way around the corner to the road and I finished off underneath the road surface there. I then continued all the way down to the uh, point which is leaving the uh, uh, end of the passing loop down there. And then I finished off the uh, last corner uh, on the third day uh, which basically leads into the uh, fiddle yard at the other end. So the ballast I've used is a Woodland Scenic's Fine Brown Ballast. Uh, it's quite a nice tone, it gives a sort of a muddy effect. Of course this is just a plain ballast at the moment but this will be weathered in uh, to blend in with the rest of the scenery uh, when I finally get it on there. Uh, I've been looking at pictures of ballast used um, in the trenches and it was very very fine stuff and um, most of it was like um, obviously covered with mud and stuff. Uh, so really this is the uh, um, best sort of ballast that I think quite uh, suits the layout quite well. Uh, of course, as I mentioned, uh, the whole blank area in the middle will be absolutely filthy with uh, fake mud. And I'm sure I will be getting some of that on the ballast in that area to show where obviously vehicles have dragged it across the tracks. Uh, and of course the soldiers with their muddy boots would also drag it across the ballast as well. So uh, that will also be added at a later date. But for now, I'm very pleased with it. It's gone down quite well. Um, it's solid as well. Uh, that's one thing I was quite worried about. Um, sometimes uh, ballast has a habit of peeling off. Um, and on, especially on this section on the far left, I noticed um, on the uh, sort, of, sort of when I finished off at the other end that it was sort of peeling off. So I went over the whole area again with another layer of watered down PVA uh, with um, more PVA to water so it's quite thick. Uh, and as you can see it drained through quite nicely and it doesn't leave a, a glossy effect or anything. So I'm, I'm really really pleased with that. I've also finally got around to painting the road. As you've seen in previous updates, so this was just a, a blank bit of card. Well, all the card sections have uh, now been painted. Uh, they still need to have their final coat uh, once they've been put in place. At the moment, they are still loose, uh, hence the, uh, the, the, the gap you can see between uh, this section here and this section uh, that leads off to the back scene there. Um, they are not glued down yet. I thought I'd save that until I start doing some of the uh, landscaping on the hillside at the back so I don't end up getting any paint or any uh, polyfiller or any stuff like that on top of the um, road surface and ruining it. Uh, so I'll glue that in at a later date. But once it's glued in, I'll go over uh, with another layer of the paint I've used. I've used um, Green Scenes Textured Paint, which is a great paint to use for road surfaces. It really is worth it. It's a, a really thick paint with lots of um, like gravelly bits in there. And I used it to great effect on Compton Martin. And when painted down, it gives a great effect of a road surface. Uh, they do all different colours. This one is in fact concrete. Um, of course, the road is not concrete. It's supposed to represent a gravelled road. But I feel the colour gives a nice base colour, at least for the uh, gravel surface. Of course, this will be weathered down um, at a later stage once it's finally in place. But the good thing is it's very, very thick, as I mentioned. So basically, you can fill in the crack with the paint itself. And once that's all glued down, I'll put another layer on and the, the, the join there will not be noticeable. Um, I've also done some work on the crossing, which we will take a closer look at uh, now. So the crossing has been mentioned uh, quite a bit in previous updates, uh, especially as to how I was going to sort of depict how the track actually crossed the road. Uh, looking at pictures of uh, trench railways, there were sort of two ways that they were really done. The first was uh, the track was sometimes laid on top of the road surface itself and then sort of uh, ballast and chippings and stuff like that were piled up either side of the rails and sort of raised the road to the rails. 
Uh, and in other cases, um, they sort of dug up the road, so dug a sort of gully through the road, uh, laid in the track, and then sort of infilled around the rails. And that's what I've gone for with this crossing here. So I've given the effect that the road was sort of dug up, The ball it's a gravel road, so the gravel road was sort of dug up, uh, the track was then set in, and then the gravel was replaced around the edges of the rails. So as you can see, there's a, still a section of the original road surface left in between the rails there. And what I've done is, um, I've actually, that's the only bit of the road which has been permanently glued in so far. So it's been glued in, and then I've gone over it again with a textured paint. And as I mentioned, it's really, really good for filling in any gaps. And the paint sort of goes into all the little cracks that were left along the side of the rails. And it's filled in, it's now perfectly flush with the rail heads. And I'm really pleased with how it's gone in. It's uh, nice, nice and in there, it's not going to come out. Uh, and also it's not going to hamper uh, the trains running over the top of it as well. But uh, I've decided to go something a bit different uh, regarding the in-between the rails themselves. Uh, as I mentioned, um, they sort of used uh, sand and uh, bits of leftover ballast and stuff to sort of raise the height in between the rails themselves. So um, they sort of here and here. So what I've done is I've uh, got some ballast and I've raised the uh, level of this in between the rails to the height of the uh, road, uh, the, the surface of the road. And uh, yeah, and I've basically just glued it down pretty much like what I've done with the rest of the ballast. And uh, again, I've used the, the water PVA mix uh, and it's gone nice and solid, so it ain't going anywhere. Again, this will all be weathered and toned in once I've uh, finally got around to permanently laying the uh, rest of the road surface down and it'll all be toned down and you've sort of given a real muddy wash because uh, at the moment the the sort of the the beigey sort of grey uh, concretey colour of the road is a bit too vibrant especially for this sort of scene uh, so this will all be toned down to a sort of a quite a dark muddy brown at some point and it will blend in quite nicely. So one of the biggest changes I'm sure you're all very excited about is the addition of the trench walls and as you can see, I've been very busy on this front, and so far I've constructed about two thirds of the walls that will feature on the entire layout when it's complete. So what I've done is I've just done the basic section of the wall at the moment, uh, which is the uh, planking that retains the, uh, the earth behind it. Uh, of course, I will have the, all the supports and uh, other little details I plan to add to these uh, walls. Uh, they will all be added at a later date, but for the moment I just wanted to make sure I had all the planking the right size and that it fits in well on the surrounding landscape. I've also added some of the scenic rocks, uh, ready rocks, uh, to give the effect of uh, where basically the soldiers when digging these uh, trenches uh, came across hard rock and basically planked around them, uh, very much like what they've done in the real trenches. So as you can see, I've uh, done the section coming off the road, around the artillery gun, and then into the trench which the railway runs into. I've also done a little section on the other side of the uh, back scene, uh, which gives the effect of if you look down through the, uh, little, the, the, the portal in the back scene that runs into the fiddle yard, it gives the effect that the train is continuing running into a trench. So it gives the effect that the trench is a lot longer than what, what it actually is, and there's no fiddle yard uh, there at all. Uh, what I have done, however, is just to the left, you can see there is a, a bit of a trench wall that's got a bit more detail on it than the rest. And I've just temporarily detailed this bit up uh, to show you what I hope the trench of walls to look like uh, when they are fully complete. So this is what the trench walls will look like when they are complete. And as you can see, we've got the addition of the corrugated iron strip along the bottom as well as the uh, vertical timber posts which hold back the planking which thus holds back the earth behind them. Now these walls were extremely easy and very cheap to construct. In fact many of the items used to construct these walls are actually leftover household items and you can pick them up uh, pretty much anywhere for nothing if you uh, don't have any lying about. The only sort of cost to these walls is the Woodland Scenics Ready Rocks but they really do add to the effect and they certainly are well worth it. So these trench walls actually started off life as a cardboard box or a cereal box. Uh, I basically cut down the cardboard to size and I painted it brown. And then on the front of it, I then glued coffee stirrers, which act as the planking. Now, of course, you can pick these up at coffee shops, uh, but if you need a lot of them, like what I've done, you can pick them up uh, in bags from uh, any sort of high street shop uh, for practically next to nothing. 
You then simply glue them on and then you paint them to the desired colour. I've gone for a very, very dark brown and then I've also gone over with a, a wash which sort of highlights the uh, grain effect of the coffee stirrers which really does give this lovely wood effect. Um, and uh, the dark brown sort of really enhances the look that this trench wall has been here for quite a while and it's sort of uh, you know, been you know, falling into sort of disrepair in a way and it's starting to splinter and stuff but it's still holding up and doing its job which is precisely what I want this uh, sort of railway to depict. Uh, once they are all glued down and painted, uh, you then add on the uh, corrugated iron strip. Now I've got a full tutorial on the way on how I constructed the uh, corrugated iron strips. They're very, very easy to do. They are in fact constructed from an aluminium takeaway tray. And uh, these corrugated iron strips uh, can be used on many modelled projects, which is why I've decided to do this tutorial, as they're a very, very handy uh, material to have. So you can use them as roofing material, and also like for walls on buildings, for corrugated iron buildings, and of course, like what I've done for the trench walls. So uh, I'll put a link to that tutorial in the description below when I upload it, and also I'll pop a little link on the screen as well, so do check that out. As for the vertical posts, they are actually bits of wicker from a wicker garden border, which I picked up for uh, just a pound, from a certain high street store, no guessing as to which one, and I just simply just snapped the pieces to size and uh, just glued them on. And uh, as you can see, it's given a real nice sort of splintered effect by snapping them and looking at pictures. Um, quite a lot of these timber posts used to crack and split in all the change in temperatures and weather conditions. So uh, just by snapping them rather than cutting them, it really does add to this effect and gives the effect that these trench walls have been here for quite a while and are sort of really feeling the uh, wear and tear of the elements. So uh, do let me know what you think of these trench walls. I'm very pleased with how this uh, little section has turned out. And I've now just got to repeat this effect on all the other uh, bits of the wall all the way around the uh, railway. So as I've mentioned in previous updates, it's extremely hard to come across World War I items that are the correct scale for this layout. Uh, things like tanks, vehicles and uh, artillery guns. Now as you've seen in previous updates, I've been using a naval gun which I plan to modify uh, to give the effect of a, a, you know, a sort of a field artillery gun. But really the conversion wasn't really going well and it wasn't coming out as well as what I hoped it would, would do. Uh, and I've sort of really given up hope on trying to find a proper artillery gun until I went to a recent model railway exhibition where I came across a stand run by a guy called Andrew uh, who runs a little company uh, called A. Wilkinson 3D Printed Items and uh, I was having a look on his stand and he came over and showed me around and uh, sure enough I spotted a few World War One tanks which he started showing me them in greater detail and they are really really superb. He had a number of tanks including a Mark V which I've been after. Uh, but um, he then showed me this and as soon as he showed me it I was totally blown away as it was precisely what I was looking for. It is in fact a BL 9.2 inch howitzer artillery gun. Now these are iconic with the Great War and were used by both sides and there are countless pictures of these guns in use uh, during the Great War and this is the gun that I really wanted to try and turn that naval gun into and he showed me this and he explained it was a 3D printed kit one of his range and um, it was 1.72 scale which is not far off the correct scale for what I needed it's basically the closest scale I can get to um, the correct scale which this layout is and I was totally blown away. I, I said, how much is it? And he explained it's £15 for the kit. Uh, and it comes with the uh, spent shells, which you can just see to the left. And uh, shells that are ready to be loaded into the gun. And all you just need to do is just uh, file it down. It'll get rid of the sort of the, 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 the little rough edges that obviously come from 3D printing. Glue it together and paint it up. And you're ready to go. And uh, basically, he explained uh, his whole range. Um, I've put a link to his website and his Facebook page in the uh, description below. So do check him out. He's got a vast range of tanks and other um, war items on there as well. And really is a great chap. And I had a good chat with him. And I, I, I just can't thank him enough uh, for producing this gun. Because this is precisely what I was after. And uh, yeah, I'm over the moon with it. So uh, as you can see, I've just temporarily set it up here. Uh, it still needs to be constructed. I've got obviously got to glue it together, file it down, uh, paint it. 
and uh, other bits and pieces but I've just set it up temporarily to sort of see if it fits in the area and as you can see it fits in there absolutely beautifully so I'm really really pleased with it so be sure to check out his website and of course uh, drop him a message if there's any other uh, products that you're after and I'm sure that if there isn't anything in his range he did explain that he is always producing new models and I'm sure that if anybody wants a specific item I'm sure he could get on and produce it for you. So do check it out and once again I would like to thank him very very much for producing this kit and of course filling the gap uh, of a proper artillery gun which is really really needed on this layout. So now we're going to take a closer look at what I've been doing on the underside of the baseboard. So for that we're going to retreat to the uh, garage and I'm going to flip the layer over and show you what I've been doing underneath. So I thought I'd bring the layout down out of the loft for a moment to show you a new development on the underside of the baseboard. Now this is the new point operating system, which is something I never really considered when I started building the layout. Originally I was just going to operate the points manually by leaning over the uh, back scene and switching them from above. But of course this ruins the atmosphere of the um, exhibition layout itself to uh, visitors, you know, having your hands sort of constantly um, switching the points in the scenic area it really does ruin the feel of the layout in general. So I started looking at different systems on how to operate the points from the back of the layout. Uh, and originally I was looking at point motors. Now these would involve a lot of wiring and electronics and switch systems, which is something that I'm not very good at. <laughs> Anything that I wire up tends to fail at some point, and uh, really just having a mass of wires underneath this board um, would just be asking for trouble. Basically, I could see uh, wires getting snapped off and uh, basically points not working and basically just getting tangled up. And this is something you know, I, I never really wanted with this layout. You know, just, just something simple and something that's pretty much fail safe. And this is the system that I've decided to go with. In fact, um, I actually owe this sort of uh, seeing this system um, to a friend. Uh, basically, I visited his house recently, and he's building a stunning little micro exhibition layout. And uh, to which he flipped it over and showed me the point operating system he had on his layout. Now um, he got the idea from none other than Chris Navard. And as you know, I've mentioned Chris Navard quite a lot in a number of my previous exhibition videos, uh, as basically he's quite a big inspiration um, for my sort of ideas that I've had on my exhibition layouts. So he sort of patented this great little cobble idea with Das Modeling Clay which of course I put to great effect on Compton Key and basically his micro exhibition layouts in general are just a great inspiration and I'm always picking up ideas from his amazing modeling tips and tutorials in uh, Model Rail magazine and anyway turns out one of his tutorials was on this point operating system which of course my friend got the idea for his layout from and upon seeing it, I couldn't believe how simplistic it was and so simple, but yet at the same time so effective. So what you've got here is a dowel, uh, which goes through um, to the back of the layer, which is where the fiddle yard is too, up here. It goes down through, there's a support there to hold it in place. And then there is a steel pin. This is from a uh, nail gun, which has been filed down to size and it just surprisingly fits in the hole on the point. This is threaded through the point and sort of um, glued into the dowel and basically it creates a manual connection so if I pull the dowel or push the dowel as you can hear the point is being thrown on the scenic side of the layout and as you can see there's four bits of dowel so this uh, dowel here operates the uh, point leading into the passing loop this one here operates the point that uh, leads to the two sidings it's sort of the goods yard area if you can call it that um, this one here operates the uh, point that leads to those two sidings and that one on the end operates the other point that's at the other end of the passing loop. And it's a very simplistic and fell safe idea and it's just perfect for this layout. It's light, it doesn't add much weight to the layout and it's really really strong and if something ever goes wrong it'll be easy to fix. And it also gives me the option of allowing me to operate the layout from the front. So if I've got the layout on a leg, I can simply put my hand under the board, pull the dowel there, and I won't have to have my hand on top of the layout um, or lean around and operate switches from the back. The only thing that I need to do to finish this off is adding some sort of uh, decorative um, 
sort of um, holder onto the end, or uh, like, maybe like a knob off of a, a um, chest of drawers or something, to make it easier to uh, grip onto, and of course pull and push. So once I've got those on there, the system is done. So whilst we're at the loft, I thought I'd show you the uh, track plan in the fiddle yard, and as you can see it's coming along nicely. The uh, main passing loop, which is here, has all been pinned down, including all the track that goes around and out onto the scenic area. But the um, siding at the back, I'm still uh, waiting on a bit of track to arrive. As you can see, I've got a, a left-hand pair of points there, but there, it's upside down to sort of pretend to give the idea that there's a right-hand pair of points there. But that um, is the bit of track I'm after. And once I've got that, I'll be able to extend uh, this siding here up to about there. So I'll be able to store some rolling stock and extra locomotives in there as well as having a slightly longer siding which will go along the back there. Um, ideally I would have liked a pair of points in there and then a long siding around there but we needed this support in here to um, stop the back scene from um, falling back uh, as of course this layout is going to be uh, carried around and I don't want to sort of knock, uh, take any chances and knock the back scene and of course it uh, bends and breaks so having the extra support there was very much needed. But still, it provides a good amount of storage space for a rolling stock. And of course, there's the odd space on the end here, just off, off the screen to the left, as well as just there, which gives plenty of room for storing other locomotives and rolling stock not on the track. I've also made a start on the wiring. As you can see, there's a couple of wires there, uh, which will lead eventually to the controller, which will be located here. Uh, the wires go into the board and then they are soldered to two fish plates on the corner here. So we've got one, uh, the red wire leads to that uh, fish plate there and the black wire to that fish plate there. And once all wired up and connected to the controller that should hopefully provide power to all of the track and all the sidings. Uh, which is why I've chosen the controller to be down at this end and the sidings to be sort of facing in the direction they are so I can isolate them and uh, ECT. Now. Um, as for the controller, it will most likely be the Gage Master Combi controller I've been using uh, in the past, but I want to give the option uh, for this layout to be operated from the front, so I'm not sure whether that could be achieved with the Combi or whether there is an attachment that could be plugged into it, or uh, which I doubt, or there is a, a type of um, another controller which could be sort of sat here on an extendable um, wire which will allow me to operate from the layout from the front and also uh, allow me to walk around with the controller on the back. Um, this gives me the uh, bonus of having the layout put into tight corners at, at exhibitions meaning I can sit around the front and operate the layout uh, with the layout up against the wall but also it gives me the option for uh, operating the layout up in the loft. Of course as you've seen in previous updates um, this um, fiddle yard is up against the uh, main layout which means I can't access it including the controller which is one of the problems I've had with uh, Compton Key and um, Compton Martin when it was up there which sort of makes them a bit unusable in the loft. So the idea of having uh, an extendable uh, controller on a lead uh, really will be very helpful for operating up in the loft as well. So that's all for this update. I hope you all enjoyed the progress that's been made over the past few weeks and I hope to continue the work on the scenery in the next update including finishing off the trench walls, uh, continuing the uh, landscaping of the hillsides as well as hopefully adding the mud effect which will play a crucial uh, part on the layout when it's complete. So I hope you all enjoyed and all that's left for me to say is this has been SDJ Arsenal 88 speaking and uh, thanks for watching.